Tapos na to all reporters today, no, kindly open your cams all throughout your um discussion, all throughout your um report. Guys, um reporter group 3, kindly open your cameras, please. Open your cams. So, hindi pa naka-open cam. Okay. So, alright, so start na pa. Group 3. Okay, so good morning po everyone. We are the Group 3 and uh, for today, ang i-discuss namin is uh, mga measuring instruments na ginagamit to measure the weight, the area, and the volume. Next slide. So, these are the members of our team. Next slide. And so, for the table com of contents of this discussion, we have the objectives. Introduction to weight, weight measuring instruments, introduction to area, area measuring instruments, introduction to volume, and the volume measuring instruments. So for the objectives, first is to in introduce the basic devices and instruments used in measuring weight, area, and volume. Next is to discuss the uses of weight, area, and volume measuring instrument and devices. And third is to determine the importance of this measuring instrument and devices. So first, uh, let's talk about um, weight. Wait muna. So, Nag-type lang po dito. Weight measurement. Next slide. So ayan. What is weight? So weight is the force acting on an object due to gravity. Weight is a force that acts at all times on all objects near Earth. So, in short, ang uh, weight ay ito yung measure ng force ng gravity acting on a body. So, we know na ang weight ay isa sa most familiar forces na alam natin. And I guess we are all familiar din sa formula ng weight which is weight W is equals to mass times gravity. So, ang weight nga is force siya kaya it is measured in Newton kapag sa SI unit and uh, pound force naman kapag sa English unit. And then yung mass, uh, kalimitan natin ginagamit is kilogram. Ito ay both for SI unit then an English unit. And then sa gravity, we use 9.81 meter per second squared for SI unit and 32.2 feet per second squared na makapag English. Next slide. And so, is weight different from mass? So, the answer is yes. Weight is different from mass. Yung difference between mass and weight, uh, isa, siya sa, isa, isa siya sa most uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, some students often use the term mass and weight interchangeably, which is completely wrong. Kaya uh, it is important to distinguish between them. So, tandaan natin na kapag weight, ang keyword ay um, force of gravity acting on a body. Well, kapag naman mass, ang, ang tatandaan natin is amount of matter in a body. And in addition then, ang weight ay vector quantity siya, quantity siya since ito ay physical quantity with both magnitude and direction. While ang mass ay scalar quantity since it requires only its magnitude. Next slide. Ayan. So, we're done on the introduction of weight. And now let us proceed discussing the weight measuring instrument. So, for the first measuring instrument, we have here the common scale. So, as you can see, ito yung pinaka-common na timbangan na nakikita natin sa mga markets, sa stores, and even sa ilang households. Uh, ginagamit natin ito para kuhanin ng timbang, for example, ng mga bigas, ng gulay, or ng karne, or isda. That skill is, ano, meron siyang adjustment sa likod ata or sa gilid. And then, makikita nyo na meron parang yung patungan sa ibabaw. So, para siyang maliit.
And sa paggamit niyan, uh, kailangan lang ilalagay sa fl flat surface and then yung person, uh, tutungtong lang siya dyan and then yung needle ay uh, tuturo na siya dun sa weight ng person. Next slide. And another instrument is digital scale. This type of scale ay makikita rin natin sa ibang store or sa mga market and may ilan na rin gumagamit nito bukod sa capability capability nito na mag-convert ng unit of measurements ay halimbawa tinimbang natin dito yung karne uh, meron na din siyang price na lumalabas so we can see na technology is really advancing okay so for another type of ay ito pa pala ayan so para makita natin yung difference between digital and analog scales uh, ito yung short video clip Digital versus analog scale. Analog scales don't require batteries and rely on an interior spring that compresses from your weight. Digital scales run on batteries, display a number electronically, and often have more features. Number 1. Accuracy. In terms of accuracy, digital wing scales certainly score more points over analog wing scales. The former is proven to give the most precise weight measurement. In addition to this, analog scales will display the weight to the nearest decimal point. Number 2. Scale Methodology While analog wing scales use springs for calculating your weight, digital wing scales employ the use of sensors. Furthermore, you will have to keep replacing the batteries for digital scales whereas analog scales use a spring-based mechanism with no battery change issues. Number 3. Power supply. Digital wing scales involve power consumption, functioning on batteries. If you don't replace the batteries, the signal frequency will lower due to an inadequate power supply. On the other hand, analog wing scales don't have a requirement for any power supply. Number 4. Weight. Digital scales are accurate and can tell you exactly how much you weigh. Analog scales serve only one function which means they only show weight and nothing else. They are usually preferred over the analog scales because of their precision. Number 5. Scale Display While an analog machine has a simple and straightforward display that involves a needle pointing towards a number, the digital version has an LCD screen display. As digital machines are precisely giving you reading to the nearest decimal, it is much easier to read in comparison to the analog counterpart. Number 6. Ease of use. Digital scales can be difficult to set up because they have different settings that need to be modified. This can include a body mass index, BMI, reading for which you will need to fit in your height and weight. Analog scales are very convenient this way, as there are no additional modifications needed, and you only need to stand on it to know your weight. However, if you are looking for digital scales to only know your weight and nothing else, you could opt for analog scale machines. Okay, so for the next uh, instruments na ginagamit sa pag-measure ng weight, uh, i-discuss ni Keisha Jamil. So, for manual scales naman po, manual scales are the traditional way of measuring weights. Madalang na tayo makakita nito since puro digital na yung gamit natin ngayon. Pero kung meron mang gumagamit ito, makikita natin ang mga ganitong scales sa mga traditional markets or stores. Placing the object of the scale into the weighing container and then balancing it with the weights which are provided packaged with a scale is how to utilize it. Ang common na ginagamit na load sa weights ay 50 grams, 100 grams, 200 grams, 500 grams, and 1 kilogram. Pagkatapos nating ilagay yung object na iway weight at yung load, ang sunod na step ay ang pagdetermine kung balance ba o hindi yung mm -hmm. weighing arms. If balance, we can assume na ang weight ng object ay equal sa weight ng load na nilagay nung una. So, kung ang nilagay natin na load ay 100 grams at nagbalance, 
100 grams din ang weight ng object na ating minesure. Unlike other scales, manual scales are more difficult to operate because they need weights to measure them. Since manual, manually nga ang pag ng objects at nakabase sa loads at observations, minsan talaga ay may tendency na maging inaccurate ang maging calculations, kaya kailangan nating i-check at i-measure uli yung mga kailangan nating i-measure. Next slide po. So for hanging scales naman, sometimes known as crane scales, have a hook at the top that can be used to suspend the scale from something sturdy like machine in another hook at the bottom of the scale. Karaniwang makikita natin ang mga hanging scales sa mga palengke kung saan ginagamit nila ito sa pagtimbang ng mga prutas, gulay o isda. Maaari rin natin makita ang hanging scales sa mga sorting, how sorting warehouses dahil ginagamit din nila ito sa pag ng mga packages. Next po. So ito pong video na ito magpapakita kung paano po ginagamit ang hanging scales or spring scales. The idea of using springs in a scale has been around for about 200 years now. This one is called a floor scale and this one is called a hanging scale. So let's spring right into the details here and we'll start with the hanging scale. These are commonly used at the grocery store. The more weight, or the harder that you pull on the bottom, the more that the red pointer spins on the inside. Take away the weight and the red pointer goes back to zero. Let's take it apart and see what's on the inside. The first thing you'll notice are two large springs on the inside. They are hooked onto the top piece, which is bolted to the frame of the scale. In the center, we have the gear system. This piece is called the rack. Hidden inside of here is called the pinion gear. As the rack goes back and forth, the pinion gear spins too. The rack is bolted to the frame that the springs are on. So when the springs go down, the rack goes down too, which then spins the gear. There's another tiny spring here which pulls on the rack. This ensures that we have good contact with the pinion gear. The center of the gear goes out and pokes through the center of the dial so that we can attach the red pointer. Now as the scale is pulled down, the spring stretch, which moves the rack, turns the gear, turns the red pointer, which then shows how much the object weighs. Now it may happen that the red pointer starts to get off. It's not pointing directly at zero when there's nothing on the scale. This might happen when you attach a basket to the scale. In this case, we need to calibrate the scale. That's the job of the calibration knob, also known as a zeroing screw. You can see that it goes all the way through and comes out the other side. These two are called the pivot plates. They both have a hole in the middle, which is where they attach. As you spin the calibration knob, it will push against the metal pivot plates. So as you turn the knob, the whole spring assembly will go up or down, which will just barely move the red pointer. Once it's right at zero, then you are ready to start weighing again. The reason that a scale like this works is because of something called Hooke's Law. It's the relationship between how much force you pull on a spring versus how far that spring stretches. So just for an example, let's put a one kilogram object on this spring. It stretches one centimeter. Okay, now let's double the weight. Now it stretches two centimeters. For each extra kilogram, the spring stretches another centimeter. If you put it on a graph, then it's a straight line. Or in other words, it's a linear relationship. This means it's predictable. We can now use the spring to determine the weight of an object. Figure out how far the spring stretches, which will then tell us the weight of the object. So for hybrid scales naman po, hybrid scales are weighing devices that are a combination of manual and digital scales. These scales can be used by placing the object you want to measure on the scale as well. 
These skills are ideal lamang sa pag ng mga malalaki o mabibigat na bagay tulad ng paper and cardboards in large sizes and or even vehicles. Kadalasan ang gumagamit ng ganitong skills ay logistic companies. Next po. So ito po ang video na magpapakita kung ano po ang itsura ng hybrid skills. Uline's industrial platform scales are perfect for weighing or counting larger items. They are rugged, durable, and designed for everyday use in warehouses, stockrooms, and manufacturing areas. There are two models. The H4593 has a 150 pound capacity with a 0.01 pound accuracy. And the H670 has a 330 pound capacity with a 0.1 pound accuracy. With a 14 and a half by 20 inch stainless steel platform, you can weigh and count larger items. Scales are powered by the included rechargeable battery, AC adapter, or optional 6D cell batteries. For accurate results, place your scale in an environment that is free from vibrations, excessive air currents such as open doors, windows, and heat or air conditioning vents. To weigh an item, simply place the item on the platform. The weight will be shown on the display. In addition to pounds, the scale can also weigh in kilograms. To change from pounds to kilograms, press the unit key. To switch back to pounds, press the unit key again. If you prefer to use a container for weighing, you must first subtract the container weight from the item weight. To do this, first place the empty container on the scale. Press the tear key. This will set the scale back to zero. Now, place the item to be weighed in the container. The item weight will be shown on the display. Removing the container from the scale will cause the display to read the container's weight in the negative. Press the tear key to readjust the scale to zero. Counting items using the scale is easy. To count, choose from one of four fixed sample quantities, 10, 20, 50, or 100 pieces. The larger the sample size, the more accurate the count will be. To start, press the sample key until the desired sample quantity is displayed. Place the sample quantity of the item you want to count on the scale platform and press the count key. The sample quantity will be shown on the display. Simply add additional units to the scale and the scale will count them for you. The total quantity will be shown on the display. Your Uline Industrial Platform Scale arrives pre-calibrated. As part of your routine maintenance, you may need to recalibrate your scale. Refer to the manual for instructions. Calibration can be done using both metric and imperial weights. Uline has a complete line of scale calibration weights available. In addition to weighing and counting, Uline Industrial Platform Scales will also perform check counting, check weighing, and accumulation. Uline's Industrial Platform Scales come with a one-year warranty and Uline services all scales we sell. Uline Industrial Platform Scales and accessories are in stock and ready for immediate shipment from any of our convenient locations in North America. Whatever your weighing and counting needs are, you can rely on Uline to have the solution. So next we instrument po natin is OHAU scales. It is also known as the analytical balance. However, the OHAU balance is the more frequent name. This scales precision is in weighing objects can range from 0 0.01 grams to, to even 0 0.001 grams depending on the scales manufacturer. This is why it is given the label accurate pay measurement. Sa pictures, mahita po natin yung digital and manual. Sa digital, um, it displays the measurement results on a digital screen. Um, sa manual naman ay, it resembles a balance with two or remote three arms, each of which includes a scale in a ring indicator. Next spot. So video ay digital o house balance lang po yung papakita.
Next naman, double beam balance. The double beam balance or mechanical balance is intended intended for laboratory and classroom use. Based on the basic Roberval balance principle, the double beam balance permits the, ter the determination of the mass differential rather than the absolute value between two objects. These balances are supplied with sliding masses. Scales made of double beams are known for their accuracy and durability. Double beam balance have a two-pan design that is based on the traditional verbal balance concept. They also have magnetic dumping, beams with sliding weights, and a variety of weighing platforms. Next video naman po, papakita kong paano gamitin yung double beam balance. For the last way instrument naman, wave bridge. Wave bridges, also referred to as track scales in the U.S., are spe specially designed devices for measuring big industrial vehicles and their cargo, primarily for commercial use. Wave bridges are typ typically used to identify the weight of industrial vehicles and simultaneously the weight of their contents. Many goods are often sold by weight and wave bridges are therefore the ideal solution for performing quick continuous vehicle measurements to record these metrics. Next one. Yan po yung picture. Tapos, next slide po. Papakita ko paano gamitin yung weight. The following video will demonstrate how to use a Griffith Elder multi-axle weight bridge in combination with our traffic light control, remote control activation system, and an external large display. The Griffith Elder multi-axle weighbridge makes agricultural weighing quick and simple. As the driver approaches, he presses a fob to activate the weighing system. The fob identifies the driver. As the fob is pressed, a traffic light turns from red to green, showing the driver that the vehicle can now be weighed. The vehicle is weighed in parts, the tractor first, then the trailer. As the driver moves the tractor onto the platform, the traffic light returns to red until the weight is automatically caught by the Weybridge indicator or monitor. The traffic light returns to green, signalling the driver to move forwards to weigh the trailer. As each set of axles is caught, a large numerical display attached to the weighbridge displays the caught axle weight. The indicator saves this axle weight to its memory during the process and totalizes the weights at the end. Once the final set of axles has been captured, the indicator totalizes the weights and uses a pre-programmed empty vehicle weight or tear weight to calculate the net weight of the load. The tear weight for each vehicle is associated to the fob pressed on approach. This means that the full weighing process can remain unmanned with the driver never having to leave the cab. Once the grain has been weighed, it can be taken directly into storage or to be dried. The Griffith Elder indicator keeps an accurate record of each weight that is brought in so that the farm can keep track of the yield per field across every harvest season. The Griffith Elder system is a robust, accurate weighbridge offering good value where a full weighbridge would be too expensive.
So now let us proceed discussing about the area. Next slide. Po. So what is area? The area of a two-dimensional region form or planar lamina in the plane is the quantity that expresses its extent. So uh, in short, ang area I, it is defined as the total space taken up by a flat 2D surface or shape of an object. The space enclosed by the boundary of a plane figure is called its area. So the area of a figure is the number of unit squares that cover the surface of a closed figure. So ang kalimita natin ginagamit na unit dito ay centimeter squared or meter squared. Next slide. So let us now proceed discussing the area measuring instruments. Ang unang measuring instrument natin ay ang theodolite. It is an accurate tool for measuring angles both horizontally and vertically. And it has two axes of rotation, a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. In order to find the vertical and horizontal angles in surveying, a theodolite combines optical plummets or plumb bumps, a spirit or bubble level, and graded circles. Um, itong theodolite ay ito yung mga nakikita natin ginagamit usually sa school ng mga, ng mga kabats natin or mga higher years sa atin na civil engineering. Theodolites can be either digital or non-digital. Non-digital, yeah. Non-digital theodolites are hardly ever used today. Um, digital theodolites have a telescope installed on a pedestal as well as an electronic readout screen that shows the horizontal and vertical angles. Digital theodolites are practical because they produce more precise readings by replacing the usual graded circles with graded readouts. Ang sunod po na slide ay magpapakita ng video na isang teodala. What is a theodolite? A theodolite is a device used to measure horizontal and vertical angles. Along with measuring angles, theodolites can be used for locating points on a line, prolonging survey lines, finding differences in elevations, setting out grades, and ranging curves. There are two types of theodolites, digital or non-digital, but non-digital theodolites are rarely used anymore. A theodolite is made up of a few basic components. Typically mounted to a tripod, a movable telescope will be mounted between two perpendicular axes. On top of the telescope is a sight to help assist in aligning the target. On one end of the telescope is an eyepiece for users to look through. On the opposite end is an objective lens, which is used to sight the object. A focusing knob helps make the object clearer. An LCD display shows the angle measurements. The autolites provide very accurate measurements of horizontal and vertical angles. They are used in multiple industries. The most common industries that use them are building and infrastructure construction. They are also used in meteorology and rocket launching. If you like this information on theodolites, please like this video and be sure to subscribe to our channel for more information on industrial products and processes. Next po is opisometer. A tool for measuring distance on map or plan is an opisometer. It is also referred to as curvimeter or a map measure. The tool is used to measure a line or curve by rolling a wheel attached to a handle. The wheel features a calibrated scale that shows the distance covered. Um, Johann George Leopold von Reiswitz, a Prussian co colonel, used a opisometer in the 18th century. Its original application was for military operations, like determining the separation between two sites on a battlefield. Geographers, architects, engineers, and cartographers utilize it frequently nowadays. And Edward Russell Morris invented the opisometer. It was initially described as a patent cartometer. This video is about an opisometer. An opisometer is used to measure the distance of curved lines as on a map. 
It has a wheel and a scale. It has two scales here. One is 150,000 and one to 30,000. Now the map I'm using here is 150,000. And I want to measure the distance of a portion of a road. Uh, this road here, uh, which is curved at this point. So what I do, I put the opisometer on the map so that the wheel touches the point I'm starting from. Then I move along that line, that curved line, which is a road, until I reach a place where I'm going to stop in order to take the measurement. So I move like that, and let's say I want to reach here, okay? So I remove and read the distance that I've measured. In this case, I've got 10 kilometers. That's how we are able to measure the distance of curved lines on a map using an opisometer. If you find this video helpful, please subscribe to my channel to see more videos and to promote this work. Okay, so next one is surveyor's wheel. It is a measuring wheel or it is also known as a measuring wheel. It is a tool used for construction measurement. The development of the odometer and the measuring wheel both began on the 17th century. Despite having a crude appearance, a surveyor's wheel can be a useful instrument for simple distance quantification when used to measure distances while walking. Um, the surveyor's wheel is mostly utilized for surveying in modern times. A measurement wheel often has a body made of aluminum with solid or pneumatic tires. You drag or push the object behind you as you move. Basic rotational kinematics allows you to calculate the distance between two places while wheel is rotating. So your measurement, your measurement will be more precise the more level the surface you are moving along. The measurement may be impacted by elevation variations, rocky or soft terrain or ground debris. So sa next slide po, makikita kung paano ang paggamit ng surveyor's wheel. Hindi pa pala. <laughs> eh, so, eto, nandito yung paano gamitin yung surveyor's wheel and uh, nandito yung video presentation. Hi, we're Alexander Tallhire. My name's Bob and I'm going to show you some tool tips. I'm about to show you a measuring wheel. I mean, we've all measured things with our tape measures, but they only go up to about 10 foot or most of them about 5 meters or something like that. Uh, you can go up to the, the bigger tape measures, which are these things. and they're so awkward to use and you have to pull them out and etc etc but what you can do is we can use now what we do is we simply put it together like that and you've got a a dial on here that you just reset to zero and you just put it back so as it's on on the zero and then we mark put a mark on the floor at where we need to go and then we just start wheeling as fast or as slow as you want to and it registers how many revolutions the wheel does and it gives you an accurate measurement of how far you've been and that's how you use a measuring wheel. Uh, ang next po na measuring tool sa area po ay tinatawag na planimeter. Uh, ang planimeter po ay ginagamit para ma-measure ang area ng isang shape, regular man or regular shape Madalas po itong ginagamit sa surveying ng construction plan. Ang planometer po ay may iba't iba pong klase. Isa po dito ay tinatawag na linear planometer na ginagamit po para masukat po yung area ng mga shapes na long at narrow po. Ang isa naman pong planometer ay tinatawag pong polar planometer. 
Ginagamit naman po ito sa pagsukat ng area pero po ang paggamit po niya ay ginagamit po niya yung boundary ng shape para po masukat yung area. Dahil nga po ang kadalasang ginagamit tong planimeter sa industry po ay digital na po. Ang susunod po na video ay about po sa kung paano gamitin ang digital planimeter. Next slide po. Hi everybody. I want to show you how to use the planimeter in case you need to come in and use this on your own and I'm not here to help you. So you'll come in and ask one of the department faculty members how to use the equipment or where the equipment is and they'll give it to you. Um, please make sure that you use it in one of the classrooms or here in our office at the table. Uh, you are not allowed to take this off campus. This needs to be used on campus only. So the first thing that you're going to want to do when you use the planimeter is turn it on. You'll see the on button right here. Okay. And then you're going to want to check your units. So you'll see that in this case, I'm already in good shape because I'm in inches, feet, and acres. But this button right here that says meters to feet will toggle you between um, metric and English units. So you can click this and toggle between metric and English units. And then you can click the unit button and you'll see the little tick mark moving up and down. And you can change between inches, square inches, square feet, and acres. Now, the unit that you choose has to be the starting unit of the scale of your drawing. So for this exercise, our drawing is at a scale of 1 inch equals 30 feet. So I have to start the planimeter on inches because my drawing starts on inches. We also need to set the scale of the planimeter. So the scale of this drawing is 1 inch equals 30 feet, but the planimeter cannot convert between inches and feet. So you have to make the scale 1 inch equals so many inches. It has to stay in the same units throughout for the planimeter to work. So in this case, since the scale of my drawing is 1 inch equals 30 feet, that's also equal to 1 inch equals 360 inches because um, there are 12 inches in a foot. So I'm going to type in 360 and then hit scale. And now you'll know that the scale is in the planimeter because you'll see it say scale in the top left corner of the display. Finally, you're going to want to set up the planimeter so that everything is perpendicular and you're going to start your readings so that you can go clockwise around the shape that you're trying to measure. And you want to set it up so that the wheels are perpendicular and everything is lined up. You're about at the midpoint on the left-hand side of the shape and that you can trace in a clockwise direction. If you try to trace in a different direction, you're going to get a wrong answer. Okay? So once everything's lined up, you'll see that there's a little bullseye inside the magnifying glass. It's an orange circle with a little orange dot. That orange dot is what you're going to trace along the line of the shape that you're trying to measure. So I have everything lined up. I'm ready to go. I'm just going to push start. Now I can start tracing my shape. I'm going to hold on to the black circle only at the top of the measuring ring and I'm going to carefully trace my shape so that I can measure my area. Now, I'm not doing a very good job here. I'm being a little sloppy. So do not use the answer that I get because it's not really correct and you can't really see it anyway. Um, but note that the answer that you've been given is in square inches. You are supposed to provide your answer in square feet and acres. So you need to make sure that you convert to square feet and acres to complete this assignment. Also, please note that if you are doing this for real in the field, you should take three readings and take the average of those three readings to get a correct answer. All right, good luck using the planimeter. Ang next naman po na measuring tool ay tinatawag na filler gauge. Ang filler gauge naman po ay ginagamit para i-measure yung width gap or clearance ng mga object na masyado pong maliit yung space para gamitin ng ibang tools, katulad po ng measuring tape. May iba't ibang sukat po na present po sa filler gauge. In case po na wala doon yung sukat na bagay po sa object na hinahanap po ninyo, 
pwede nyo pong stack yung yung mga sukat po sa filler gauge. Halimbawa po ay, ang available lang sa filler gauge ay 0.0015 inch at 0.0020 inch. Pero po yung object po, ang width gap po niya ay, ang sukat ay 0.0035 inch. Pwede nyo pong pagdikitin yung dalawang available po, tapos makakabuo na po kayo ng 0.0035 inch. Para po mas maintindahan po natin yung filler gauge, yung next po na video ay about po sa filler gauge po. Join Mechanical Engineering Certificate Courses for free with practical approach at gagehow.com. Hey guys, I'm Mokshida. Welcome to Gagehow. Do subscribe to this channel to expand your knowledge. This video is about feeler gauge. A feeler gauge is used to measure the clearance between two parallel flat faces, for example, piston and cylinder. Feeler gauges are used for measurement of clearances. It is a tool that measures air or narrow gap widths between two surfaces in engines and machinery. Feeler gauge is available in a number of blades like 10, 13, 20 and 28 with a step of 0.05 and 0.1 mm. The feeler gauge has two major parts, a body or block which acts like a protective case or sheath and a large number of blades of different thickness. The thickness of the blades are in fractions of mm and inches, usually ranging from 0.03 mm to 1 mm. The working of feeler gauge is easy. The blades are kept on the vacant gap that needs to be measured. Initially, one blade of standard thickness is kept. Then if there are extra gaps, other blades are adjusted and joined together and used. One must ensure that the blades can be easily pushed to and fro and are not tight. In order to have a problem-free measurement, the blades should be free of dirt and grease. That was all about feeler gauge. Subscribe to Gauge How to stay updated. Uh, last po ay Gunter's Chain. Isa din po sa tools na ginagamit sa surveying ay tinatawag na Gunter's Chain. Isa po itong measuring device na nag-measure po ng distance. Uh, ito pong Gunter's Chains ay meron po siyang 100 links na ang total measurement po ay 66 foot ang haba. Ang measurement naman po ng bawat links po ay 0.66 feet or 7.92 inches. Ang next po na, ang next slide po ay about po sa video tungkol po sa gutter chains at kung paano po ito gamitin. Hi! My name's Kate and I work here at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery and I've chosen to talk about this Gunter's chain today. It's a really interesting object and it's, a, it's known as a Gunter's chain but it's also known as a surveyor's chain because surveyors used to use them to measure out land in order to make maps and um, to yep, divide up space. So what I'd like to do is open up this chain right away. So Richard, if you could come over and help me to lay it out, the whole 66 feet of chain or 22 yards, which also happens to be. So the way these were used is that they were basically sort of dragged through the bush to measure and you could put a pole down through this handle and then through the handle that Richard's got the other end you would measure your chain and then keep the pole in one handle and take the chain around to keep on measuring. And someone would therefore be recording how many chains you had. So 10 squared chains make an acre. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And then you notice a tag. So you know how far along the chain you've got. Then in another 10 links, you'll find a different tag so you know where you are so you can imagine being out in the bush and going over rocks and boulders and trying to get around trees and trying to measure out land it must have been quite a task and also probably out for days and weeks measuring out the land this Gunter's chain was named after someone called Edmund Gunter who is a British man he was a clergyman and a mathematician and the date that's that's written that he invented is 1620 and surveyors actually were using them up until the mid 20th century as a in the T-Mag collection we do have 
a Gantas chain in the collection in one of our Bond store exhibitions. So ayan po, ang another measuring tool po ay scale ruler. Ang scale ruler po is a three-sided or triangular that architects, engineers, and designers use. So basically, kapag ginagamit ang scale ruler, hindi na natin kailangan gumawa ng mathematical calculations or conversions dahil ito ay nakascale na sa mismong ruler. So ayan po, next slide po for the video. Hi everyone, in this video... We we'll learn the basics of reading and using an engineer scale. The scales are 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, and 60 feet. On the 10 foot scale, one inch equals 10 feet, where each increment equals one foot. So one inch equals 10 feet, two inches equals 20 feet. And on the 20 foot scale, one inch equals 20 feet, but each increment still equals one foot. Where a half inch equals 10 feet, one inch equals 20 feet, two inches equals 40 feet. And on the 30 foot scale, one inch equals 30 feet. And the same goes for the 40, 50, and 60 foot scales. Now let's use what we've learned on a simple drawing with a dimension of 35 feet and a scale of one inch equals 20 feet. We'll refer to the 20-foot scale, line up the scale on the marks, and note 10, 20, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 feet. In this example, we have a dimension of 81 feet with a scale of 1 inch equals 40 feet. We'll refer to the 40-foot scale, line up our marks or line up our scale, and read 40, 60, 81 feet. And that's the basics of reading and you. So I measure, and I believe familiar naman na po tayo dito. So as we know, ginagamit po ito sa pagsukat ng size and distance. Ang typical measuring tape po is consists of a case, a thumb block, a blade, and a hook. And sometimes meron din po itong belt clip. Sa paggamit naman po ng measuring tape, una po ihuhuk natin siya sa isang side ng object na susukatin natin. And then stretch natin yung tape across the object until ma-reach natin yung desired measurement. And then pwede natin ilock yung tape using the thumb lock para hindi ito mag-retract. And then from here, pwede na natin i-write down yung sukat. Next slide po. Ang next na instrument naman po ay caliper. Ang device po na ito ay ginagamit sa pagsukat ng distance between two opposite sides of an object. So ang caliper po ay ginagamit para ma-transfer ang dimension from one place to another. Um, next slide po. Ito po yung mga types ng caliper. Ang una po ay ang inside caliper. And also known po ito as straight caliper kasi kung mapapansin po natin, straight po yung legs and turned out the top. Ginagamit po ito sa pag-measure ng inner dimensions or diameters of the object such as the inside diameter of the hole or the internal diameter of a cylinder. Next slide po. So yan po yung itsura kapag ginagamit ang inside caliper. Next slide po. Ang next type naman po ay yung outside caliper or also known as egg calipers or bow caliper. Ginagamit naman po ito sa pag-measure ng external diameters or width ng object. Next slide po. So yan po ang itsura kapag ginagamit ang outside caliper. Next slide po. So ayan, makikita po natin yung sinasabing pag-transfer ng dimension. So when in using this kind of calipers, need pa rin natin ng scaled rule or ng straight edge. Next po. 
Another type naman po ng caliper ay yung divider caliper. Ito naman po yung also known as the compass. And basically, parang compass lang din po siya kung gamitin. Like yung ginagamit natin sa pag-draw ng mga arcs. Next po. Another type po is yung ad leg caliper. Ginagamit po ito sa pag-mark out ng surface of ng, ng sheet metal or for checking the parallel edges. Next slide po. So, ayan. Hindi. Pakipa, ano, nung sa previous yan. Makikita po natin dyan yung kung paano mag-work yung ad leg caliper. So, nasa bent leg po yung scriber point na nagraran along the surface ng workpiece. And then yung straight legs po with locating notch sa dulo ay nakalodge against the one edge ng metal sheet to ensure na yung line na makikreate ay parallel sa edge. Next po. Another type po ng caliper ay yung dial caliper. Ito po ay yung handheld measuring tool na ginagamit para masukat ang dimensions ng objects with high precision. So, meron po itong two parts, yung fixed jaw and the moving jaw. Sa paggamit po nito, ilalagay yung object between these jaws and then isasara po to make them in contact with the object. And then, yung dial indicator will provide the measurement. Then, pabasahin na lang po ng user yung measurement kung saan nakapoint yung dial's pointer. Next slide po for the video. This image shows the basic components of the dial caliper and how it will be used. These calipers are able to measure external, internal, and depth. The jaw is open by sliding the vehicle holding the dial down the bar. Before any measurement can take place, the jaws must be cleaned. After they are cleaned, the calibration knob must be loosened on the bottom of the dial. With the jaws fully closed, adjust the dial to show zero before retightening the knob. For external measurement, the outside measuring jaws should be opened enough to enable them to surround the desired part to be measured and then tightened against it, twisting the fine adjusting roll. Once the jaws are firmly against the part, it is now time to analyze the measurement. First, the marks to the left of the dial must be counted to find the larger measurement. Five marks are visible, giving the initial measurement five hundred thousandths of an inch. The dial indicator shows a measurement of eighty thousandths of an inch which will be added to the initial measurement of 500 thousandths for a final measurement of 580 thousandths of an inch. For internal measurement, the inside measuring jaws should remain closed until they are within the area to be measured. The 200 thousandths mark is clearly visible giving an initial measurement of 200 thousandths of an inch, which will then be added to the dial indicated 10 thousandths, which gives us a final measurement of 210 thousandths of an inch. For measuring depth, Extend the depth rod farther than the depth of the part being measured and lower the end of the bar down to the upper point area. The scale bar shows the measurement is past one inch but does not show any additional marks. The dial indicates a measurement of 83 thousandths of an inch and when added to the initial measurement, the final number is one inch and 83 thousandths. Another type po is the vernier caliper. Ito po yung ginagamit sa pagsukat ng lengths, diameters, and thickness. Tulad po ng dial caliper, meron din po itong two jaws, yung main scale and yung vernier scale. So, meron po akong video kung paano gamitin and basahin ang vernier caliper. Next slide po. The second precision measurement tool is the vernier calipers. This tool is similar to the dial calipers in terms of how to use it, except the dial indicator has been replaced by the vernier scale. Before taking any measurements, ensure the jaws are wiped clean. Like the dial calipers, tighten the jaws against the part to be measured. Once the jaws are firmly against the part, it is now time to analyze the measurement. On the upper left side of the vernier scale, the zero mark is to be lined up with the bar scale. This shows initially a measurement of 500 thousandths, along with three marks, which account for 25 thousandths each making the initial measurement 575 thousandths of an inch. Once this is found, determine which division line on the vernier scale best lines up with the division on the bar scale. This determines how many thousandths of an inch will be added to the initial measurement. Here, the five thousandths mark 
lines up the best and when added to the initial measurement gives a final measurement of 580 thousandths of an inch. For internal measurements using the vernier caliper, just like the dial calipers, tighten the inside jaw against the inner walls of the desired part. The zero mark on the upper left portion of the vernier scale lines up with the 200 thousandths of an inch mark of the bar scale and with no 25 thousandths mark to be added in. Once this is found, determine which division line on the vernier scale best lines up with the division line on the bar scale, which in this case is 10 thousandths of an inch. When these measurements are added together, the final measurement is 210 thousandths of an inch. Meron pa pong isang type. Ayan. Ang digital caliper naman po ay mas modern na measuring tool that provides digital readings of object dimensions. Meron po itong features such as the digital LCD na nagdi-display ng measurements directly in inches or millimeters. And just like the previous types, the dial and the vernier caliper, ilalagay din po yung object in between the caliper jaws and then babasahin na po yung measurement displayed on the screen. The next one on pong measure, measuring instrument is the gauge block. Gauge block is our system for producing fusion lens. The individual one gauge block is a metal or ceramic block that has been precision ground and lapped to specific thickness. Gauge blocks come in sets of blocks with a range standard lens. In use, the blocks are stuck to make a particular length or height. Um, this ang sunod po slide ay yung video po para paano po siya gamitin. Hi, I'm Paul from Engineering and Gauge here in the UK. And today I'm here to talk to you about gauge block sets, sometimes known as slips. The sets come in various compositions, steel or tungsten. They come in various quality grades, grade two being workshop, grade one being in... Here we have an M47 set. I'm going to show you how to use gauge blocks to make a reference size. So I'll pick a size. For example, 30.235 millimeters. So we start with the lowest denomination, the five. So from this set, we pick out a 1.005 and wipe the gauge block with the wiper. We then pick out the three. So that's a 1.03. Again, we wipe the lapped polished surface of the gauge block. And in a moment, I will show you how to ring them together. We now have the 0.235. We need 30 millimeter, which comes in one block here, which we wipe the lapsed polished surface and now ring the blocks together. We do this by placing one on at 90 degrees and then twisting it round. That has now rung in place. With this one, same again, bring it on that has now rung in place. We now have a stack there of 30.235. We can now place it under a comparator, for example. Here, adjust to zero. Here, we now have at zero, we know we're at 30.235 and we can start measuring parts in comparison to the size we have set. All the gauge block sets that we supply come with a UCAS certificate of calibration. I have one here. And on the second page, you'll find the report of each individual gauge block to an uncertainty of measurement of one hundredths of a micron. We also, for, cal for your own calibra internal calibration, we supply micrometer check sets in eight or 11 piece. These are for you to calibrate your own measuring hand tools. Please visit our website engineering-gauge. Ang sunod na po instrument ay meter stick. Um, lahat naman po tayo pamilyar sa kung paano po ginagamit ang meter stick then Ang meter, ang meter stick po yung ginagamit pag use po ng length and usually po ang um, nakikita po natin ang nagagamit natin meter stick ay gawa po sa wooden. Next slide po. 
Then, ang sunod naman po ay micrometer. Ang micrometer, sometimes known as micrometer screw gauge, is the, is the device incorporated a, a calibrated screw by the used for accurate measurement of components in mechanical engineering and machining as well as most mechanical trades, along with other meteorological instruments such as dial, burner, and digital calipers. Micrometers are usually but not always in the form of calipers. The spindle is very accurate the machine screw and the object to be measured is placed between the spindle and the anvil. The spindle is moved by turning the machine knob or timbal until the object to the measure is lightly touched by both the spindle and the anvil. Next slide po. So next naman, so next naman po is yung volume measurement. So yung po nga dyan sa uh, slide is uh, other information about volume. Pero for simple defini definition po for volume, it is simply defined as the amount of space occupied by any three-dimensional solid. Yung mga solid na yun, it can be a cube, a cuboid, a cone, and a cylinder or a sphere. So Merong, yung different shapes na yun, meron silang iba't ibang volume. Next slide po. So, ayan, makikita niyo yung mga formula ng volume ng different geometrical shapes. For cube, V is equals to A cube. For cuboid, V is equals to length times V times height. Sa cone naman ay V is equals to 1 third pi R squared H. For cylinder, V is equals to pi R squared H. And for square, V is equals to 4 over 3 pi R squared pi r cube. Next is the measuring me volume measuring instruments. So first, we have Baker. So lahat naman siguro familiar na what Baker is. And as you can see in the picture, a Baker is a cylindrical container having a flat bottom, an open top, and a small outward turned out lip or yun tayong tawag ng pick. So, dun sa side na, makikita nyo na marong marks. And yun yung nag indicate kung gano'ng karami yung liquid na nasa loob nito. Ito kasi, um, as you can see, in the picture, it comes in a variety of sizes. And ito rin is, it can be made of plastic or glass. Pero glass yung madalas na ginagamit, especially in experiments. Kasi, first of all, because of their transparency. Second is for their chemical resistance. Third, it can withstand exposure to extreme temperature. Easier to clean. And lastly, it can be heated without breaking or melting. And the ang beakers are frequently used for holding, stirring, and heating solutions and other samples. Next. 
Firstly, select a clean beaker of suitable capacity. Then pour in the solution you need to mix. Please note, the beaker cannot be directly heated, you need to use asbestos mesh isolation. Asbestos mesh to ensure even heating of the beaker. According to your requirements. You can use a thermometer to measure if the required temperature is reached. Finally, we use the standard method to extinguish the alcohol lamp. So yun the video, uh, since familiar naman na kayo sa beakers, pinakita lang naman kung paano gamitin ang beaker. So next it is yung burette na tawag. And it is a long graduated tube, usually glass, with a valve at one end. It is a laboratory apparatus made of either glass or plastic. On the burette's walls, so katulad ng sa beaker, meron din siyang volume scale naman dito. And it is commonly used in the titration process. So ang burette, it ka, um... It is classified as a liquid burette or yung gas burette na yung tawa. Next po. So, in a liquid burette, the valve is located at the bottom. It va its valve controls the flow of liquid. When the valve is opened, fluid flows due to gravity. And the amount of liquid can be measured by reading the volume mark on the tube. Next po. So, for gas burette naman, uh, bali ang pinagkaiba lang ng liquid and gas burette is yung location ng valve nito. Kasi for liquid, di ba, as, um, uh, as what I have mentioned earlier, it is located at the bottom. But if gas burette, so yung valve niya is nasa top. And ito naman, it is filled with a fluid such as water, mercury, or other type of liquid and is connected to a fluid reservoir at the bottom of the tube. The gas is collected by removing the fluid from the burette. And para ma-determine yung volume ng gas, the volume of the displaced fluid is used. Next po. So yung next po is a video clip. Um, para po ipakita ko we'll paano... begin with the parts of the burette. At the very bottom is the tip to which liquid flows out. Above the tip is the stopcock, which allows us to very carefully regulate the flow of the liquid. And above the stopcock is the barrel, which is marked with graduations. Notice at the very top of the barrel is a zero milliliter mark, and at the very bottom of the barrel is a 50 milliliter mark. Before we begin, it is good practice to first clean and then rinse the burette. To clean, we'll pour a few milliliters of deionized water into the barrel, making sure the stopcock is in the closed position. Then turn the burette into an almost horizontal position. The deionized water should then slowly flow towards the top of the barrel. Holding this position, rotate the burette to the cleaning step. Repeat this rinsing process two additional times with small volumes of your solution. And certainly a lot less error prone. Notice that when the stopcock is perpendicular to the barrel, it is fully closed. When the stopcock is parallel to the barrel, it is fully open. And when the stopcock We are now ready to read the initial volume of the burette. First, position yourself such that you are eye level with the meniscus to avoid parallax error. We see that the meniscus is between 5 and 6 milliliters. Further, it is between 5.6 and 5.7 milliliter marks. And finally, estimating to the hundredths place, I record the initial volume as 5.67 milliliters. The final volume of the burette. Meniscus is now between the 11 and 11.1 milliliter marks. And finally, estimated at the hundredths place, I record the final volume as 11.04 milliliters. The volume delivered in my experiment then is the difference between these two readings, 11.04 and 5.67 or 5.37 milliliters. When we are finished with the burette, first allow the solution to fully drain out of the burette. So next naman po is yung glass pipe. 
So it is also known as chemical droppers, and it is used for transferring small volumes of liquid. They operate by creating a partial vacuum above the liquid holding chamber and then releasing it to extract the liquid from the solution and dispense it in another container. So katulad ng dalawang na ano na um, materials ay meron din tong marks dun sa gilid niya and nag-indicate din ito kung gaano karami yung ama amount ng liquid na nasa loob nito. So it comes in different sizes. And ang um, kadalasan ng material na ginagamit in creating glass pipettes is yung borosilicate glass. It is because borosilicate glass is a durable and heat-resistant material which can withstand chemical exposure without shattering or corroding. And next is the video clip po on how to use it. Welcome to the video on techniques on the use of a pipette. In this video, we will show you how to smooth and flat. If the top end of the pipette is chipped or not smooth, it is very difficult to pipette. When using the pipette, do not pipette the solution directly from the flask in which the solution is stored. This could contaminate the solution. Always choose an appropriate clean and dry beaker and pour a small quantity into a labeled beaker. Here we have two beakers which contain the same volume of solution A. Compare the depth of the solution between the 50 ml beaker and the 250 ml beaker. The solution in the 50 ml beaker has more depth and it will be easier to pipette the solution out of this beaker. To fill a pipette for acclimatization, use a rubber bulb to pull up the solution. If you're right-handed, depress the pipette bulb in the palm of your right hand. Hold the pipette in your left hand, but keep your index finger near the top of the pipette. This will make it easier to put your left index finger over the top of the pipette and hold the level of the solution when you remove the pipette bulb. Keep the tip of the pipette below the surface of the liquid to avoid sucking up air and sucking the solution into the pipette bulb. The level of the solution should always rise up the pipette. The solution should not drain back into the beaker. For acclimatization, we draw up a small amount of the solution, about one-third to one-half of the bulb of the pipette. Remove the bulb and tilt the pipette horizontally to rinse the inner walls of the pipette. Make sure to let the solution slide past the calibration mark near the top of the pipette and rotate the pipette to ensure the solution touches the inner walls of the pipette. Drain the solution completely. After draining all the solution used in the acclimatization, dry the top of the pipette thoroughly and repeat this step three times to finish acclimatizing the pipette. Pipette and deliver 10.00 ml of solution A. Fill the pipette with the solution past the calibration mark. Remove the bulb and quickly place the index finger of the left hand over the top of the pipette to hold the level of the solution. Tilt the pipette slightly and wipe away any liquid on the outside surface. Using the same hand, place the pipette between the second and third finger to support the pipette and pick up the beaker to bring the pipette calibration mark to your eye level. Slowly release pressure on the index finger so that the bottom of the meniscus approaches the calibration mark at eye level. At the mark, apply pressure on the index finger to stop the level of the solution such that the bottom of the meniscus is sitting on the calibration mark. Inspect the tip of the pipette to make sure that it doesn't have a hanging drop. If there is a hanging drop at the tip of the pipette, Touch the tip of the pipette on the wall of the beaker and recheck to ensure that the position of the meniscus has not changed. Now you're ready to deliver the solution into an Erlenmeyer flask. Bring the pipette to the Erlenmeyer flask and release the pressure on the index finger. Drain the solution into the Erlenmeyer flask with the pipette tip touching the wall of the flask. After draining, wait 10 seconds before removing the pipette. Good afternoon everyone. So for the fourth measuring tool, we have volumetric flask and cylinder. So above all the said measuring tools for volume, this is one of the most common and widely used apparatuses when it comes to uh, volume measurement. So nakalagay dyan, calibrated po means marked with scales. Ang means ng measurement of these tools ay nakaprint po sa mismong object and usually indicated po ito in ML or 
per milliliter because minimal lang po yung interval between each unit. Then, the volumetric flask and cylinders are usually accompany each other, but they are slightly different from one another in terms of their purposes. So, the flask is more spacious or wider at its bottom part compared to the upper part or its neck. So, this is because the flask is intended to contain liquid at extreme temperatures sometimes. So, another reason is that it is also used for mixing and diluting solids. So, wide siya sa ilalim para mas madaling magmix ng solutions or chemicals. And then, kabalig tara naman ng flask yung cylinder. So, bawal dito magmix and bawal pa initan ng too much. Since graduated yung cylinder or same diameter yung cylinder from bottom to top, it is impossible na mamix yung chemicals thoroughly or properly because limited lang yung space or yung area. Next slide po. The flask and graduated cylinders come in different sizes and capacities. The cylinders range from 2 ml to 500 ml and the flask ranges from 5 ml to 5000 ml. So, paano po ba pumili ng right size? So, the chemical to be measured the must be right below or ano, mismong sakto sa center line. So, pwedeng sakto, pero bawal siyang sobrang labis dahil, ano, for safety purposes. Next slide po. Why are these tools made out of glass? Why not plastic? So, that's because the glass has low thermal conductivity and a good heat retention. When we say uh, low thermal conductivity, the glass does not adapt the same temperature of chemicals inside of it. And in terms of good re re heat retention naman, uh, the glass can withstand a moderate temperature without breaking or losing its shape. So, in this case, plastics are not a good option for holding too high or extreme temperature. Next. Okay, so, di ko na yan babasahin isa-isa. Yeah, explain ko na lang. So, yung number one dyan, sinasabi dyan na make sure that the flask is clean and dry inside because any droplet residue can affect the accuracy of the measurement. Next, pwede rin na mag-measure sa solid like solutes tapos sa haluan ng solvent para ma-dilute or ma-dissolve. So, liquid din naman yung magiging result nun kapag measure kasi matutunaw. And next, nakadepende yung type ng solute sa type, nung, sa type at amount ng solvent na gagamitan sa, mix, sa mixture. And then next, when mixing, hindi pwedeng isang bagsakan na yung solute and solvent. The proper way of dissolving ay utay-utay lang. So, maglalagay ng konting solute, then solvent. Pag natunaw, magdadagdag na ulit ng solute. So, ganon. And then lastly, kapag na-dissolve nyo na yung, ano, yung chemicals or mixture, okay na yun for measurement or uh, for use kung saan man siya gagamitin. So, now, next po. Let us move on for the fifth tool, the micro syringes. So, from the word itself, micro means small syringe. It is also usually, dis uh, dito usually disposable, unlike the mga nakikita natin na plastic syringes. So, Yung tawag sa body niyan ay barrel, yan yung may naka-indicate na measurements. And then, yung tawag naman dun sa pinopush or pinopull ay plunger. Gawa naman yan sa stainless steel. So, it only measures liquids kasi di naman kasha sa needle yung solid kahit powderized man yan. So, papasak lang yan or babara lang dun sa needle. Next po. 
So, saan ba ginagamit yung micro syringe sa engineering industry or sa engineering lab? So, first, in fluid dispensing and injection. So, for example, usually malaking mechanism yung nakikita natin sa isang machine. Eh. Pero sa engineering kasi, madami din dyang smaller components na mas kailangan detailed yung structure. And ito daw na micro syringe ay ginagamit in applying lubricants and adhesive in to small areas whereas hindi siya accessible ng larger applicators. So, next po. For the second, the microfluidic experiment. So, when there is a need for manipulation of fluids in fluid dynamics study, so ginagamit po yung syringe to control a precise volume or amount of Element drop needed. Next po. Lastly, material testing. So, it is usually uh, useful for investigating properties which requires only a few drops. So, only few drops or regulated drops from micro syringe because the target is to only investigate the mechanical behavior of a material. Next po. So, these are the proper ways on how to use micro syringes and isasummarize ko na lang din ito. So, katulad ng cylinders, dapat ay tuyo at malinis ito bago gamitin and also before anything else, ay eh, i-check kung ayos ba yung markings sa syringe. Baka kasi may malabo or burang marking doon. So, paano kapag ginamit niyo yun, eh di parang hindi niya makikita yung right na measurement or amount ng fluid na ipapatak nyo. So, next, dapat bubble free yung chemical. Yung trick sa pag bubble free ay kailangan ay ilalagay mo na yung needle dun sa chemical then ipupush yung plunger para mag bubbles yung chemical. So, dahan-dahan lang yun bago ulit hilahin yung plunger at that time mula ng bubble na masisip. So, napanood ko lang yun sa YouTube. And then lastly, after gamitin at may tira pang chemical, edi eh ibabalik yun sa lalagyan ng chemical. Tapos lilinisin ulit yung syringe. Next po. So for the last ano, measure, measuring tool for volume, we have the piston dispenser. So sabi dito, piston dispenser offers a controlled and efficient way of handling fluids with precision. Kung makikita nyo, may scale din, may scale din yung body ng cylinder and yung blue na bilog. So next po, next po yan. Ayan, yung sa picture, kung makikita nyo, meron siyang calibration din and meron siyang blue na button, na hindi siya button eh. Parang may slide yan sa, ano, sa specific na sukat na required. So, nakalagay dyan na the heart of dispenser is the piston mechanism and we'll see later yung mechanism na yon Next po. So, ayan, hindi yan yung mismong piston dispenser na ginagamit sa ME laboratory. Um, yan ay medyo hawig lang dahil halos parehas lang sila ng gamit. Ipupush lang yung taas ng piston, then may madidispense na fluid. Uh, yung fluid na yun ay connected doon sa inlet. So, pero doon sa piston dispenser ng laboratory ay calibrated lang. May scale and adjustment. Next po. So, how does a piston cylinder works? Okay, so bali dyan sa napanood natin, once na we push the piston, the inlet or the intake valve will remain closed because the pressure of the air. And then uh, once na na-release yung, uh, yung air, yung intake valve naman yung magbubukas, then magko-close yung discharge valve. The liquid is sucked in the inlet and once the piston is pushed again, lalabas na yung liquid sa 
outlet. So that is the piston mechanism. Next po. So ayan, yan din yung proper way sa paggamit ng piston dispenser. Medyo na-explain ko na yan. So idadagdag ko na lang na meron siyang calibration. So before i-push yung piston, there is a need for setting and adjustment of the preferred volume. So for example, dun sa ginagamit niyo sa mga pharmaceuticals kapag nagre-refill sila ng gamot, ganun. For example, 10 ml lang yung kailangan, i-adjust yung button na yon or yung slider na yon yung may red sa katapat nung required na uh, volume or amount ng liquid and then Kapag pinush yung piston, edi 10 ml lang din yung lalabas. So, that is the advantage of piston dispenser kasi accurate and precise yung na uh, yung nalalabas niyang or na measure ng fluid. So, that's all for the volume measurement tools. So that's all for, for the report of group 3. Thank you for. Alright. So um, group 3, may dadagdag pa po kayo? Group 3? Wala na po sir. Wala na. Alright. So um, thank you for a very good uh, presentation of our three topics today, no? which is weight, um, area, and volume. So um, ito naman mga topics na is na encounter niyo na um, I think uh, since elementary pa so you have ideas naman na kahit hindi na natin di ba hindi na binigyan ng um, emphasis kung ano si weight ano si volume si area alam niyo na na nag-focus na lang tayo dun sa mga weight uh, sa mga instruments na ginagamit in measuring those parameters all right so uh, everyone let us give um, group number 3 a round of applause or a clap please Yes, Engineer Katapang. Yes, Engineer Ramos. Okay. So let's give them a round of applause, please. Okay. So, um, ask ko lang, no, yung mga previous group na nakapag, um, report na, na kanilang research works. Um, group 1, pakinfirm nga sa akin if nagkaroon kayo ng um, icebreaker or anything na quiz. Meron bang group 1? Wala po sir. Wala. How about group 2? Wala. Wala din? Or meron? Group 2? Group 2? Sinong pwedeng mak sumagot sa group 2? Nag-prepare ba kayo ng um, quiz or like um, icebreaker during yung nag-present um, kayo ng inyong um, topics? Group 2? Wala? Alright. So, sayang naman. No? Okay. Anyway, so um, guys, may questions ba? Any questions po? Concerns? Clarifications, guys? Wala naman po. Wala naman po, sir. Alright. So, if none, um, uh, ano ko lang kayo ng um, agenda for next week, no? So, um, did nothing matapos yung laboratory number two nyo before uh, midterm exam? No? So, we're done with the lecture naman na hanggang volume kasi ang coverage yung inyong magiging midterm exam is hanggang uh, at topics pressure hanggang volume. No? So, we, we were able to um, discuss naman those um, topics before midterm exam. Then, nakapag-contact tayo na laboratory one. Alright? However, yung presentation na yung laboratory one is hindi pa nangyayari na. No? So, yung presentation na yung laboratory one will happen na lang after midterm exam. No? But, ang um, importante is nakapag-contact tayo ng laboratory one kasi included siya sa inyo magiging midterm exam. And, by next week, Alright, by next week we will be uh, conducting um, your laboratory number 2 which is Venturi Meter. Okay, again next week, conduct tayo ng laboratory 2 about Venturi Meter. So again, yung laboratory number 2 ay included pa rin po sa inyong magiging midterm examination. Now, 
So, um, for next week, laboratory, wala namang dadalhin na uh, um, materials. Alright? So, na, uh, yung equipment naman is nasa school na, no? nasa boiler room. So, um, sa nga yung room natin, guys? Boiler ba tayo or ME Lab 2? Guys, ME Lab 2 tayo, no? ME Lab 2 po, sir. So, uh, pero magkakandak tayo ng laboratory sa ME Lab, ah, sa boiler room. So, pupunta, uh, pupunta na lang doon by group. No, so kasi mahirap pag sa pag sa ME Lab to tayo magkakandak ng laboratory kasi baka tayo ay magbaha sa ME Lab to. No? So again, sa boiler room tayo. So by group na lang ang pagpunta doon. So maghihintay na lang sa ME Lab room. Like, ME Lab room 2. Then once matapos ang isang grupo, then um, proceed sila sa boiler room. No? So um, again, walang dadaling materya. So magsasanda lang ulit ako ng tables na no? naipiprint per group. Per group nyo yung um, pagdudala ng table, no? yung uh, para sa inyong data gathering or so, saan nyo susulat yung data na ma-observe nyo. Alright? So, um, any questions pa po ba, guys? Clear po tayo doon sa ating uh, next week agenda? Guys? Clear naman po. Guys, questions? Clear po, sir. Alright. So, if wala na pong questions, um, um, I think that's it for me po. Um, again, thank you so much, group number three, for the presentation of today's topic. Um, if my questions man, no, or if my clarifications man, kindly um, send me a message na lang sa Facebook or sa ating GC. May GC naman tayo. No? So, again, um, thank you all guys for attending this class. Um, I'll see you guys next week. Bye for now. And ingat po tayong lahat sa maghapon. Plus, dismiss na po. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you.